Welcome to Crime With My Coffee. This podcast contains graphic descriptions and adult content. Mature audiences only, please. Hi, y'all, and welcome to Crime With My Coffee. I'm your fabulous hostess with the mostest, June. And I'm Suzanne. We're going to tell you some stories you've heard. Some you haven't. And some you'll wish you hadn't. All with a Texas twang. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. We're glad you could join us. As always, glad you're here. Yay, you're our best friends. (laughs) So what you got in your mug this week? Well, in my mug, I have the uh, famous uh, Puerto Rican coffee that one of my husband's friends went to Puerto Rico, asked if there was anything that he could bring back. And my husband said, like, coffee, because that's what I do. And so he brought back some coffee, and it's called Cafe Manchow. Nailed it. it. That's what I'm going to say. And I can't tell you what it says on the back about whatever it says on the back because it's in Spanish and I only do Texan, bad Texan apparently, or very hick Texan. One of the two. I don't Whatever. Know. It's fine. So but, I can understand you. But it's a, it's a good coffee. It's good. It's smooth. It's uh, robust. I guess would be a word for it. Nice. And I I like it. The aroma is amazing. And I have that and French vanilla creamer cuz that's what I like and it's good. I am all set with it. So nice. what do you have in your mug? I have hot chocolate. Ooh, hot chocolate. Yummy. Yeah, I wanted some hot chocolate and I put some of the Ghirardelli chocolate sauce in it. Oh. In addition to just my hot chocolate. Extra hot chocolate chocolate. Yes. Mm-mm-mm. Hot chocolate chocolate. It's Yum. pretty good. Pretty good. Yummy. But yeah, I just, I felt like hot chocolate today. I didn't feel I needed the extra caffeine. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go with that. Sounds good. I like hot chocolate. I, I like to too. put hot chocolate in my coffee sometimes when it gets really cold and it stays really cold all the time. I, that's that's what that I like. one week that that happens yes. in Texas every year. <laughs> that that <laughs> one that one time. Yes, that's what I like. Gotcha. Well, to everyone's surprise, I actually am going to be doing a case today. Surprise! What? Surprise! What? I know. It's almost like I need to go back to second shift because I just don't find I have time for anything. On yeah. Shift. Yeah. You might, you might need to change shifts. You might need to go back to work at nights and being a vampire. I know something, something. I'm not real sure. Well, we're going to start our little um, adventure in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now this is on the Northwestern part of Indiana. It's about 18 miles west of the Ohio border and about 50 miles south of the Michigan border. Okay. Now, it is the second most populous city in Indiana and 76th in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. But apparently, I mean, it's a cool place because it was actually... An All American City Awarded recipient for four different years. One was in 1983, one in 1998, 2009, and 2021. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, must be a, Fancy. I know, must be a, a really cool place. Now, in 2010, they did get a cultural district which has a bunch of artsy stuff and you know stuff I don't know anything about and the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo uh, has been landed as one of the nation's foremost zoos oh nice yeah yeah I thought that was 
pretty cool. I only know about the Tyler Zoo, the Dallas Zoo, the <laughs> Fort Worth Zoo. Yeah, and probably because you live in Texas. And I've heard about the San Diego Zoo. That's where the penguins of Madagascar were shipped to. Oh, yeah. I have heard of that one, too. I can tell you that in Fort Wayne, they have 86 public parks. That's a big number. It, it absolutely is. I, I'm thinking that many public parks in one town? I, I don't know. But whatever. I, I mean, city, not town. But city, whatever. Either way. So let's get to the population. In 1860, the population was 7,000 people. That's not very many. That's smaller than my town, and my town's pretty small. Well, it grows. In 1970, which is just a little over 100 years later, population is 178,269. Holy shnikes. Yes. And in 2020, the population is 263,886. Oh my gosh. Yeah, just gets bigger and bigger. A couple of notable people that I do want to mention that was from Fort Wayne is Margaret Ringenberg. She was an aviator. She uh, flew a, she was a ferry pilot in World War Two for the WASP, which is the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. And in her career, she logged more than 40,000 hours. Oh, snap. Have I even been alive for 40,000 <laughs> hours? I don't know. I'm not sure if I have. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, so I just did a Google thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't put in my actual birthday. I just put in the month and the year yeah. instead of the day. And it says that I have been alive, if I were born on that day, which close enough, mm-hmm. uh, for 359,000 hours. Oh, wow. So, okay, wow. at least I've been alive 40,000 hours. <laughs> yes. I, I, I just can't imagine flying that much. That's a lot. A lot. a lot. So, um, also from Fort Wayne, Indiana, Bill Blass, fashion designer, uh, got a lot of fashion awards. I I don't think I have anything Bill Blass, but you know, I'm, I don't have any fashions. So, well, I I mean, I don't either. You come by it honestly, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at being a girl. Yeah. Yeah. Join the club. Join the club. Yeah. Yeah. I was indoctrinated from birth. Thanks. (laughs) And the last person that I want to mention from Fort Wayne, Indiana, is Jalen Smith, who is a linebacker for the NFL. And I now blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Uh, From 2016 to present time. Plays for the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, fancy. I know. That's your favorite team. Uh, I, it is. And it has been for a very long time. But, I mean, think about it. They're actually America's team. That's what they're named. The, they're the America's team. Everybody knows about the Dallas Cowboys. Whether they like them or not, totally different. But everybody knows Everybody. Well, most people. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. So on December 24th, which is actually a good day to have a birthday, if you're raised right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you added that. Yeah, it makes yeah. me think that the person we're going to talk about was who was born on this day uh-huh. was not raised right. Um. Probably not. But I mean, we're here, so obviously not. Well, I mean, that is true. That is true. But on December 24th in 1939, a little boy named Dean Arnold Coral was born. His mom 
very protective, you know, the protective mom over her kids. Uh, she ended up having oh, two. So the total opposite of you who just kicked us out of the door and said, go do whatever and You're just come home later. Get out of my house. <laughs> You're fine. You'll be able to make it. Uh, father was kind of strict, but I understand because he was drafted uh, by the U.S. Air Force. So he was drafted or he enlisted? He, he actually was drafted. Oh, OK. Yeah. So anyway, uh, mom and dad are together. They kind of fight a lot and ended up getting divorced in 1946. But because she was a concerned mother and the kids wanted to be close to their dad and their dad really kind of still wanted to be close to the kids. She moved into a trailer, not far from where he lived so they could still see each other. Nice. So not a bitter baby mama. Right. Right. Now Dean was about seven years old when this happened, but he ended up getting sick and he ended up having an undiagnosed case of rheumatic fever, which usually develops about two or three weeks after having a strep throat infection. And it does in- occur usually between the ages of five and 14. So after he gets this strep throat, uh, like I said, he, he ends up getting rheumatic fever, but it, it went undiagnosed for a long time and some of the effects uh and involvement that it has uh includes the heart the joints uh skin brain and and they get a rash well they didn't find out that uh dean actually had this until he was about 11 years old and he he had gone into the doctor for something and the doctor found a heart murmur So his doctor said, you know what, because of this, the heart murmur and everything, you can no longer do P.E. I know most kids would be like, woohoo, no more P.E. I know. I know. I know. Well, I wasn't like that. No, me neither. This was in 1950. And like I said, he was about uh, 11 years old at this time. And I guess because mom was living close to dad, they still had a lot of probably interaction together. They decided that they were going to reconcile. So they did. They got remarried and moved to Pasadena, Texas. Okay. So number one, if I'm going to divorce you, I am not going to remarry you ever. I'm sorry. I understand there are people that do and they make it the second or third or fourth time that they remarry said ex-husband or wife. But if I and you and we split, mm -mm, there's a reason for it. It doesn't matter. There's a reason. Period. End of story. Game over. That's what I say as well. That's what I say. If I divorce you, there's a reason. And I've, I've yeah. never understood people like that. Me neither, but I know people like that. And I'm, I'm pretty like, sure okay. I do too. Oh, I'm pretty <laughs> sure you do. Pretty sure you do. And I just don't under I've never understood it. Like there's No. No. There's, I, I don't you're... get it. I don't get it either. But anyway, so they they get remarried and like I said, they moved to Pasadena, Texas, which is in the Houston Woodlands Sugarland metropolitan area. And it is the 20th most populous city in Texas. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was, never would have thought that. At me neither. So the population in 1950, about the time that they moved down there, the population's 22,483. In 1970, the population is 89,957. But in 2020, the population is 151,950. In the Pasadena area, if I did not mention this, I would probably end up being divorced because my husband would divorce me. But they had a country club down there called Gillies, right? It was done by Mickey Gilly, who was a musician, a singer, 
country music way back in the day. They had a mechanical bull, bull and this was basically the largest honky tonk in the world. They ended up filming a movie there in 1980, and this movie was called Urban Cowboy. If you haven't seen it, I suggest, I mean, watching it once or twice. That's my husband's favorite movie ever. But it starred, uh, what, uh, John Travolta, Deborah Winger. But unfortunately, Gillies did burn down in 1990. And now the school district down there owns the lot. So if I didn't mention anything about that, I would be one of those people who got divorced. So interjection note, note to self right here, (laughs) delete all of that (laughs) and see if it happens. Right, right. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know. I know. Well, the parents still couldn't get along because they ended up getting re-divorced in 1953. There's a reason they got divorced in the first place. I know. I know. Well, I mean, it lasted three years. I don't know. Mom's like, you know what? I'm done with you. She finds a traveling clock salesman, ends up marrying him, and they moved to Vider, Texas, which is about 89 miles from Pasadena. They're happy. And then in 1955, they welcome a little girl. And so Dean ends up with a half sister. Now he already has a brother by his mom and dad, but now he has a half sister. Mom and dad, mom and his stepdad decide that they're going to start a a small family candy company out of their garage. Dean and his brother would help out as much as they could Um, After school, they ran a lot of the machines, they packaged the product, and the stepdad sold the candy along his route that he had for the clock selling that he had going on, and it actually did very well, but he realized that most of the candy that he sold was in the Houston area. So Coral ends up going to high school. He was just an average student, but his only real interest that he really had in school was in the band and he played trombone. He graduated in 1958 and then the the family, his mom and stepdad and and half sister and little brother ended up moving back to the Houston area. This way, they were actually closer to the area that bought the most candy. So they opened up a new shop. So in 1960, uh, Coral's about 20, 21. Uh, His mom's like, you know what? We moved, blah, blah, blah. Not really working for us. You should go move in with your mom in Indiana or your grandma in Indiana. Kind of help her out because she needed some help and everything. And Dean's like, okay, I'll do that. So he goes moves in with his grandma in Indiana, stays there for a couple of years, and then ends up moving back to the Houston area uh, to help the family out with the candy business that he had. And this time they actually had a shop, not just in their garage, but an actual shop in the Houston Heights area, which is, I don't know, maybe 20 miles from Pasadena. So it's, it's not that far. Not not too much of a commute. No, not at all. Dean, when he moved back uh, to the Houston area to help the family and everything, went and got a place that was above the shop, the candy shop that they had. It was like a little apartment above the shop that he ended up staying in. I've always thought that would be really cool. I know. I always thought that would be really nice too. Plus, I mean, you're working, if you're working down in the shop, you ain't got to commute except for down the stairs. Mom and stepdad, something happens. They're not getting along. So in 1963, they ended up getting a divorce. Well, because they've been in this candy business for a while, 
she decides she's going to open up a candy store of her own and she's going to name it after her kids. She's going to name it the Coral Candy Company. And so she made Dean and his Dean like the vice president or something and made the brother that he had uh, the secretary treasurer. Right. She kind of did this because she was in competition. She felt maybe, I guess, a little bit with the stepdad because, you know, they had done this, made this candy company. In August of 1964, Coral is drafted to the U.S. Army. He goes to Louisiana for the basic training. Then he goes to Georgia for his training after that. And then he ended up going to Fort Hood, which is probably about 200 miles from Pasadena. But he didn't like the military at all. But he had a good record there. He, you know, he didn't get in any fights or anything like that. But he did apply for a hardship discharge because he said, well, my family needs me to help run the business. And so I need to be there to help them. And they gave him an honorable discharge. Wow. Yeah, on June 11th of 1965. So he actually only served 10, 11 months in the military. He had that much military service and that was it. That's not much. No. So he gets out of the military and he decides he's going to go back to Houston Heights area and help work in the family business. Like I said, he had some, they, they had competition from the stepdad's candy shop. But Coral decided he's going to work as much as he can and make it better than stepdads and everybody's going to know his candy. So eventually the shop got moved to another shop that was right across the street from an elementary school. Anyway, he would promote and pass out candy and that was the perfect place right across the street from an elementary school. Heck Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So he ended or in up in front of my house. It's fine. I mean, as long as it's good candy, I'll take it. Yes. Heck yeah. So Coral ends up becoming known as the candy man or the Pied Piper because he's passing out all this candy. Well, in 1967, he's about 28 at this time. He is out passing out candy and everything. And he befriends a 12 year old boy. And over the next few years, you know, he's he's around this boy a whole lot. This little boy's name is David Brooks. Uh, he was born February 12th, 1955. So he's 12 and um, Coral is about 28. And I'm just assuming that uh, he probably met him passing out candy at the elementary school or whatever. But he he's around this boy. And I what I want to say is he's kind of grooming this boy. Right. I'll be your best friend. We can be best buds. We can do right. things together. And a creepo you know. McCreeperson. Yes. Yes. Well, about a year later, mom decides that she's going to get married again. And that didn't last long. But she ends up moving out of state. And close down the candy store. Uh-oh, time to get a new job. I know, I know. Now, Coral talked to his mom quite often, even though she was out of state. They talked quite often. And he did find another job. He went to work as an electrician at uh, the Houston Lighting and Power Company. He was testing relay systems or something. But it was a it was a job. It was a good job. It it made him money so he could afford whatever he needed, you know, apartments, you know, groceries, who knows Lights, what else. Water. Lights, water. Yeah, all that. Well, in 1970, Brooks is about 15 and he decided that he was going to drop out of school. So he did. But his mom moved because her her and Brooks's father ended up getting divorced. 
So mom and Brooks end up moving to Beaumont, which is about 85 miles east of Houston. But his dad remained there in uh, the Houston area. So Brooks would go back and forth and visit with dad and, and everything like that. But when he came, he didn't really stay with dad a whole lot. He went with, he went and stayed with Coral most of the time. And that's only because he was probably a lot more fun. He didn't put restrictions. You have to be in the house at a certain time or anything like that. He was more of a buddy. That's we just creepy. Say. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's what happened. Red flag. Yeah. Definitely some red flags going on here. Hold on. Let's pull. Let's 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 do something you'll understand. There's a flag on the play. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Just right before Brooks moved off, Coral kind of was trying to talk him into a sexual relationship, you know? He's like, you know what? Look, I mean, I got cash. I'll buy you whatever you want. But you have to give me a blowjob. Okay, this is way more than just a flag on the play, y'all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely is. Brooks was like, uh, I mean, I do want all this stuff and, you know, but I don't know. Well. Then, on September 25th of 1970, 18-year-old Jeffrey Conan vanished while he was hitchhiking uh, with someone else from Utah. He was going to his parents' house, and they dropped him off around 6.15 near uptown Houston. 1970 was a big turning point. Because Brooks walked in with Coral and a couple of teenage boys at one time who were tied up to the bed and Coral and these two teenage boys were having fun. And Brooks is like, what the fuck? And he's like, well, you know what? If you don't say anything about what I you know, me and these boys were doing, I'm going to buy you a car. Brooks is like, oh, uh, I mean, I'm 15, 16 years old. Of course I want a car. So I don't care. Hey. And y'all, she's been using a lot of air quotes in these past couple of sentences. Yeah. Well, Brooks was like, okay, I'll take a car. So Coral ended up buying him a 1969 Chevy Corvette. Coral also told Brooks that he would pay him money for any boy that he was friends with or maybe not friends with if he could lure them back to his apartment. He would pay him $200 per boy. Okay, this ref is running out of flags to throw on the field for these I, plays, you I guys. Know, I know. So $200 back here in 1970, technically in today's money, is about $1,500. It's a lot of money. Brooks is like, well, you know what? I mean, why not? Why not? There's lots of reasons why yeah, not. Well, I mean, but there are, on. I know there's lots of reasons why not. But Coral had told him that these boys were for... A, a different purpose. They were being sold kind of on the black market or whatever, you know, and no harm was coming to them. Everything was fine. Everything was well and good. And Brooke's like, well, okay, but you're giving me $200. I, I guess I can help you out. So on December 13th, 1970, Brooks lured two 14 year old boys. One's name was James Glass, and the other one is Danny Yates, to Coral's apartment. Now, James knew Brooks because they had previously been there before, just briefly, you know. So he didn't see any problem with it. And, you know, he had his friends with him, and he's like, yep, okay, you know, let's go. So they go, and. Unfortunately, these two boys were put on what turned out to be referred to as a torture boy board. 
that coral had. It was just a big piece of kind of like plywood or something. And they were tied to this. And unfortunately, they were raped, strangled. And then Coral talked Brooks into helping him bury these two at a boat shed that he had rented just the previous month. Okay, that's dumb because now your name's tied to it. But okay, carry on. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, first off, he's dumb anyway. But yes, yes. Then on January. He's not even trying to be smart about it. No, no. But I mean, he gets away with it for a while. On January 30th, 1971, brothers Donald and Jerry Waldrop was walking home from a friend's house. And Coral kind of enticed them to come into their van, come into his van. And Brooks was there with him. So they were like, yeah, okay. I mean, you already got a teenager with you and we're teenagers. So yeah, yeah, we will. We'll come back, you know, and party at your place like you're saying we're going to do. So they did. And unfortunately, after they got back to the apartment where Coral was living, they were raped and strangled. And buried in the boat shed. A couple of months later, on March 9th, 1971, 15 year old Randall Harvey was riding his bicycle for his part time job. I think he was delivering newspapers or something, ends up going missing. Well, We know where he went missing to because Coral enticed him into coming back to his apartment and partying and all this and subsequently ended up being shot in the head and killed. Don't, I, I believe he was buried in the boat shed as well. Then on May 29th, 1971, 13-year-old David Hillicus and 16-year-old Gregory Mallory Winkle were abducted and eventually killed. So we got people missing, you know, parents are like, uh, what happened to my kid? But they just, you know, most kids that ended up missing Back in the 70s, a lot of the police departments just figured they were runaways. So they didn't really investigate a whole lot. And that still happens today. It does. And I think it's horseshit because let's say 13-year-old Timmy next door ran away from home because he got in a fight with his parents or whatever because they grounded him because they're good parents. Mm -hmm. The fact that he ran away doesn't mean that you don't need to go find him, you freaking cops. It doesn't mean that anything... But I'm sorry. That's just a pet peeve of mine, and it irritates me to no end if my kid is missing, whether they ran away or whatever, you need to find them because my kid is missing and is a kid. I get it. I get it. I understand. I totally understand. August 17th, 1971, 17-year-old Reuben Haney, who was a friend of Brooks's, was persuaded by Brooks to go to a party at Coral's place, and he ends up being strangled and buried in the boat shed. Then September 1971, Coral ends up moving, and shortly after he moved, Brooks, who's about 16 about this time, ends up helping Coral abduct two more boys who were, of course, abused and eventually murdered. And the identities of both of these victims remain unknown. Then comes along winter of 1971. Brooks brings another friend of his to Coral's house under the assumption that, you know, they're going to party and 
Brooks is probably thinking that this guy is going to be Coral's next victim, but it is uh, Elmer Henley, who is about 15. But for whatever reason, Coral decided that this kid could be an accomplice with him and Brooks. So he offered him the same deal, $200, to bring boys to him. He, and he told Henley that this was because he was involved in a slavery ring, you know. Henley was, was not about it. He's like, uh, no, I can't do this. But after a few months, ended up giving into it because he actually needed the money for his family. And this was early 1970. 72 when he finally agreed to Coral's proposition. And here I thought we finally found someone with some sense. Well, I mean, he almost did. He almost did. <sighs> well, in early 1972, Coral moves yet again. Uh, it's about February, I believe, when he moved. He he moved around a lot. And like I like to say, oh, you move because the rent's due. But I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is around February-ish. Uh, and he he moved. And Henley said that he's getting involved about this time. So Coral and Henley are out. Uh, Coral had a van that he drove a lot, um, and I think that was to entice the children and have children and have plenty of room uh, for two or more people because he had a car, but I think it was a muscle type car, you know, that probably didn't hold a lot of um, kids and maybe weapon that he was using. Henley gets involved now, and Henley and Coral lure a couple of youths back to Coral's home uh, so they could party, you know, smoke a little weed, drink, whatever, and they did. So he actually made up a, what he called a handcuff trick, right? And he put, uh, Henley put the handcuffs on and was able to take them off because he actually had a hidden key on him and convinced one of the other kids to put them on who didn't have a key. Henley convinces one of the other kids to put the handcuffs on. He doesn't have keys, so he's not going to be able to get out, right? So Coral sees this opportunity and ends up putting a gag in his mouth. And he told Henley again, well, that's because he's being sold into a sexual slavery ring and, you know, you're done. So go on. Henley's like, okay, see ya. After he left, Coral ended up abusing him and strangling him and killing him and there you go his remains as far as i can tell the remains of this this kid uh is unknown now we're going to come to march 24th 1972 18 year old frank agara was leaving a restaurant where he worked when what i'm going to call the three amigos brooks henley and coral ends up showing up in the van and convinced him to go back to a party at the apartment that he was living at that Coral was living at and the kids like you know what okay I'll I'll follow you there cuz I have my own car so Frank ends up following um Henley and Brooks and Coral and it turns out Frank was actually Hen Henley's friend. So they go back to the apartment. They do a little smoking, a little partying. 
And then all of a sudden, Coral jumps up and just pounces on Frank and handcuffs him, by, gets his hands, handcuffs him behind his back, gags him, and then said, dude, I, I don't want to do this, but guess what? Gonna happen. So Henley, who had already helped in assisting something like this, said the th- same thing that this had happened before and I, I'm I'm out of here. So he leaves and then Frank was eventually killed and then Coral and Brooks ended up helping, you know, bury him at High Island Beach, which, which is about, I don't know, an hour and a quarter from Houston Heights. On April 20th, 1972, about a month later, all three of them, all together again, they ended up grabbing 17-year-old Mark Scott, who knew Brooks and Henley both, and he fought back and was trying to stab him with a knife, and they got a gun and pointed at him and said, you know what? Nope, we're going to win. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. They get him back to Coral's place. He's put on the torture board, just like Frank was, raped, tortured, strangled, also buried at High Island Beach. And then around June 26, 1972, two more young men, Billy Balk and Johnny DeLome, were abducted and ended up having the same fate as the two before them and were buried at High Island Beach. Around this time, around June, Coral moves again. But this time, he ends up moving into a house, not an apartment. He's like, let me try my new house out. So he ends up luring 19-year-old William Riddinger to his house, and he put him on the torture board. He abused him. Brooks, for whatever reason, somehow or another talked Coral into letting him go. So Coral was seriously thinking about letting this guy go. And then Henley was like, what the hell? I No, he ran up and knocked Brooks out and then put him on the bed and tied him down. Then, of course, Coral assaulted him several times and then released him. And for whatever reason, Brooks, and I know it's because he was groomed from a very young age, continued to assist Coral in whatever he needed. So we're going to pause here because it's really something else. And we're only about halfway through and we have a lot more to go. Ah, two-parter. You're going to make me wait a whole week to hear what happens next. Well, I'm going to make you wait, but if you're a Patreon member, you don't have to wait. You get both of them. Yeah, part two is waiting for you right now, you guys. Go listen to it. Yes. But if you're not a Patreon member, like me, you got to wait a week. Got to wait. We'll be back. (laughs) And until then, okay, bye. Bye. Bye.